Thanks for coming along tonight, folks. Ehud Iyari makes a welcome return to the Sydney Institute. As you know, he's been here quite a few times before, and we always look forward to him coming and talking to us. And thanks to the Australia, Israel and Jewish Affairs Council, who made Ehud's visit here tonight possible. He's well known, so I'll introduce him very briefly. He's the Middle East correspondent for the Channel 12 News in Israel, a very important news channel. And he's also a fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Studies in Washington, D.C. And the topic for tonight's talk is looking ahead to the post-Gaza Ward era. Ehud Yari, you're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Jarrah. I'm very uh, happy to be again at the Sydney Institute. It's always a pleasure. I promise I will be frank and sometimes blunt, hoping that you will excuse me for that. I will start by where we are coming from. I think people now we have a war of uh, simultaneously. It's only one that it's the war in Gaza. But there are other wars. And they are all linked together to the fight uh, against or for the Iranian attempt to establish their predominance all over the region. I'm not going into uh, all the wars that are raging on. I'll just give one or two examples. The Turks are about to invade northern Iraq to establish a 40 kilometers deep security zone. And they will also act again in Syria, militarily. In Syria, we have uh, enormous amount of clashes in the north uh, east of the country between different players and we have a confrontation between Syria and Jordan with the Jordanian Air Force small Air Force capable pilots for the first time ever hitting targets inside Syria because the, Syri the Syrian uh, army, the fourth division, under the command of the brother of President Assad, Maher, with Iranian uh, uh, sponsored uh, militias, are moving, smuggling huge amounts of drugs, mainly amphetamines, captagon, and weapons, rockets, anti tank missiles, etc., across the border into Jordan, trying to build a military infrastructure there, at this point, sleeping cells, and getting weapons across into the West Bank. And I can go on and on and on. Gaza is but one front, a very important one, of what's going on now. Now, what really happened Gaza. The Israeli um, intelligence community had known since 2021, with indications before, about a plan called the Wars of Jericho of Hamas to invade Israel. They didn't really take it seriously. They felt they were deterred. Yahya Sinwar, the leader of Hamas, now deep in the bunker, was interested in uh, improving the li lives of uh, uh, the uh, people in, in Gaza. They felt that by allowing Qatar to send to Gaza suitcases with millions of dollars cash, uh, they can buy quiet or an extended uh, ceasefire. On the night before the uh, October 7th attack, 
they had more indications that something was imminent. But Hamas, for many months before, was holding a big drill called the Tall Pillar, in which they would uh, train their uh, uh, fighters, their terrorists, on how to get uh, to Israeli military positions across the border with Gaza, how to capture a kibbutz or a village, uh, etc. So our people were accustomed to seeing this drill. And when uh, they learned that the uh, elite uh, commando uh, unit of uh, Hamas called the Nukba, Nukba is elite in Arabic, the chosen ones, were called to the mosques at 3 a.m. in the morning, they felt, oh, we have another stage of the drill that we already know a lot about. Uh, but it was not. So there was a consultation at night between the generals, Israel too, in Hebrew, uh, heading uh, our uh, military intelligence, people who should not be should not have been appointed to these posi sensitive positions in the first place. Uh, they had a consultation and they decided we'll wait for the morning. What they didn't do was A, they didn't call on the uh, division commander, territorial uh, division in charge of the 65 kilometers of the Gaza border to deploy his troops and be on, the, on full alert at dawn, as is customary, by the way, in the Israeli army. And worse than that, they did not call the commander of the Air Force, asking him to do the obvious, get 10, 12 attack helicopters close by, under ready. And I'm saying 10, 12 uh, attack helicopters would have killed this attack along the fence. But they were not there because he was not alerted. And it took 20, uh, 40 minutes for two attack helicopters to come down, uh, to get down to the front from a base in northern Israel. That's an intelli intelligence uh, failure of unbelievable proportions. And all these people will resign when they have the first opportunity. The second point, so we have on the one hand a major failure of Israeli intelligence based on a decade and a half of conviction, what we call in Israel in good English conception, that Hamas is deterred. The same way as Hezbollah in Lebanon is deterred since 2006, the war of 2006, the second Lebanon war. What happened was that over the past two years, maybe more, there were very intensive deliberations between uh, leaders of Hamas, the Hezbollah, and the Iranians Republican Guards Quds Force, which is the organization in charge of all the militias in the region. If you remember Qasem Slimani, uh, killed by the Americans, outside the Baghdad area, he was the father of this uh, organization. In those deliberations, about which the Israelis uh, knew, in those deliberations, the leader of Hamas in Gaza, who is the only one, who, who is the only guy who counts, 
Yahya Sinwar, 22 years in Israeli prison until he was released in some exchange deal. A guy that I've met quite a few times when he was in prison, fluent in Hebrew, knows everything about Zionist history and Jewish religion. Sinwar, who was not present at, the, at these deliberations, being in Gaza, had his loyal representatives in the discussions, and he was led to convince, or to be safe, allowed himself to be convinced that he has a promise from the Iranians and Mr. Nasrallah, Secretary General of Hezbollah, that if he goes on the attack, there will be a second and third front, Lebanon and Syria. I cannot tell you because I don't know whether the Iranians misled him intentionally. I suspect so, but I don't have proof. So he has decided, he didn't share with them, not the zero hour, not the full scope of the attack he had in mind for security uh, reasons. There were only three people in the leadership of Hamas, Yahya, Sinwar, his brother, Muhammad, and another guy, uh, the chief of staff of Hamas that was probably killed last week. It's not totally clear now. Marwan Issa. They were the only three who knew that the people who were called uh, to the mosques at 3 a.m. in the morning would be sent home, pick your weapons, and report for duty. And they went for the biggest possible operation. They could have uh, decided to attack one or two villages plus one or two military positions, grab hostages, and then negotiate for an exchange with uh, Palestinian prisoners and be victorious. No, because he had this, what he thought was this Iranian Hezbollah guarantee, he decided to go big. How big? 3,000 on the attack of this Nukba. 60 points entry crossing the Israeli barrier along the border of Gaza, going after any, every kibbutz and settlement and village and town around Gaza. Sometimes it's five, ten minutes walk to get there, but they came with Toyotas, the white Toyotas, the new camel, I call it. With the Toyotas, with many motorbikes, gliders, and they went for everything. And the plan was, why does he call it the Al-Aqsa flood? Al-Aqsa is the holy mosque in Jerusalem. Why did he call it the Al-Aqsa flood? Because he wanted the attackers to the West Bank, 40 kilometers away, no more, to get to the city of Hebron and light up West Bank, like this. Can you imagine what would be the reaction in the West Bank when they see Hamas driving into Hebron and maybe beyond? The orders for the attackers and the kind of equipment they had with them were to stay, to barricade themselves inside Israel and keep fighting from there. This did not happen. Their instructions were to go uh, all the way to the port of Ashdod and certain military and mainly airport, air force bases in the south. An extremely ambitious plan. And he knew, I know Sinwar, he knew that this will force Israel to do what Israel never planned to do and had no plan, by the way which is to recapture the Gaza Strip. 
when the war broke out, October 7th, the IDF did not have a plan to take over the Gaza Strip. They had to improvise, call some generals from reserve, uh, etc. Why didn't they reach the West Bank, which would have been a game changer? Because they fell upon this music festival, the Nova, they called it. And there were so many girls there, good looking, and so many hostages to be taken, and people to be butchered. So they stopped. What happened to the Iranian promise? Hezbollah debated about 24 hours what they will do, and they decided they will go for a confrontation restricted to around five kilometers uh, uh, across the border, including my home village, Metula, which is the northernmost point in Israel, now totally evacuated like many other uh, towns and uh, villages uh, in the area, and you cannot even visit your orchard because it's a now restricted military zone. And you go there, you will be fired at by uh, uh, Hezbollah. So Hezbollah decided on a limited response in Syria, long front on the Golan Heights. Here comes Mr. Putin. And whatever we think, feel about him, about Syria, he immediately told the Iranians, no go. Syria is out. Russia has invested so much in Syria since the outbreak of the civil war in 2011. Russia has two military bases, one naval, one air force, in Tartus and Khmeimim. The Syrian army is not capable of waging a war. But uh, Syria is out. And basically, Syria is out. So the Iranians uh, arranged for the Yemeni Houthis to uh, uh, close shipping to an extent at the Bab el Mandeb uh, Straits at the uh, southern end of the uh, Red Sea. Now, the war. So this is the background. The war is mostly over. And to give an example, uh, at the height of fighting, we had five divisions in Gaza. Seven soldiers and that many tanks and armored carriers and whatever. And of course, the Air Force always above. Now, we have maybe three and a half brigades, 7,000. They are outside the cities. What they are doing is, when necessary, when Hamas squads uh, pop up, they will go in, deal with them, and get out. Like is what is happening today again in Shifa Hospital in Gaza, which is the jewel of the reporting of ABC. <laughs> well, in the past 24 hours, they have captured another round of few hundred Hamas and Islamic Jihad terrorists in Shifa, killed 170. In the last 24 hours, it's all in the bunker system and the tunnel system under the hospital. And the Israeli army goes there with the doctors. They enter with the doctors. They give prior warning. And they come with medicine. It's war, it's ugly. But they come with medicine, with supplies, in order to get down to the uh, tunnel system. And this is the second time the IDF is operating in, in uh, Shifa. Because the first time, they played a trick on Hamas. 
they left, they destroyed much of the uh, bunker system, which sometimes is 40, 60 meters deep in the ground. But they left two big bunkers, two big systems. Now, Hamas felt that they can go back to Shifa Hospital, that's the biggest hospital compound in, in uh, Gaza, and they came for them. Um, again, you wouldn't hear about it in, on ABC. Uh, not that we are, me, because I care about Australia, my wife is Aussie, not that we are not trying to tell them, well, try to see the other information than the one you are broadcasting. The answer is uh, uh, no. Generally, before I go to the uh, what's coming next, we have the uh, constant uh, advertising of the numbers of casualties civilian casualties, reported by Hamas, disguised as the, the health ministry of Gaza. What health ministry of Gaza? I know the guy, Yusuf Aburish, he's Hamas. And I can refer you with pleasure through Gerard and the number they are giving now 32 civilian casualties, more than two thirds uh, uh, women and children is totally fabricated. According to the latest uh, studies of the casualties reports, the most is 18,000, out of which 12,000 at least are Hamas and Islamic Jihad fighters. That's a ratio that was not achieved by the Americans when they were fighting ISIS in Raqqa and Mosul or Fallujah. We, we, I'm not here, I'm not the spokesman for the government of Israel or for the IDF, but I don't know any army that had to fight this kind of urban warfare underground amidst very dense civilian population where your adversary is using almost every single house, family homes, etc., as a, weapon, a weapons depot, as a point from which to snipe and shoot and booby trap and whatever you know. The army made millions how many, but millions, calls to civilians. Get out of there, we are coming. Leaflets. To the point that the Israeli army provided to the population, publicly, maps of their deployment and where they are going next. I don't know any other war. In, in, in which uh, 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 it happened. So now we are in a situation where I said the war is basically over. The main campaign is over. We have Hamas converted from a terrorist army well equipped, well tunneled, uh, converting Hamas into, from a terrorist army into an armed underground. You still have quite a few Hamas armed squads popping up here and there. Uh, and to make it clear, out of 24 battalions of Hamas, their battalions are um, uh, sort of uh, territorial. Each neighborhood has its battalion with everything. So out of 24, 19 were dismantled. Doesn't mean everybody got killed or injured. And there are four battalions remaining in the uh, city of Rafah, the southern 
end of the Gaza Strip on the border with Egypt, in which uh, you also have 1.2 million Palestinians, civilians, many of them displaced from the north. The Israeli army is not going to storm Rafah with that many civilians there. And this is why the Security Council revolution, a resolution which was not voted, not vetoed by the United States, reflects the situation on the ground. Nobody is going to mount an attack on uh, uh, Rafah during Ramadan, during the holy Ram uh, months of Ramadan, still about two weeks to go. What the Israelis will need to do, and I think they will, is to uh, take over the uh, strip 14 kilometers long uh, of the border between Gaza and Egypt. Because under this border, uh, the tunnels there uh, allowed Hamas for years to get equipped, to get weapons, to get components for assembling we uh, weapons in workshops in Gaza, usually, by the way, underground. And if you don't seal the border with Egypt, what did you achieve? We have very good cooperation with Egypt, but we cannot change Egypt. I'm speaking to you as somebody who lived years in, in, in Egypt and who, loved, who loves Egypt. Because there are ways to get Egyptian officers and police guards and whatever you know to cooperate with the smuggling. Fact of life. And then you seal Rafah from the along the border with Egypt and from the north. And if they take my advice, they, why should they? I would offer uh, terms for surrender to this. Uh, this is the worst the brigade of uh, Hamas, by the way. I would offer terms for surrender. If you won't go out to Iran, Algeria, Syria, I don't care. Uh, I don't believe this brigade is going to fight. I don't believe we are going to see a Palestinian Masada in uh, Rafah. But I may be. Where we are going from here? Number one question is uh, to get the human humanitarian aid uh, flowing in. Dropping from the air, even if King Abdullah of Jordan is in the cockpit, getting a nice photo or uh, uh, the Americans building now a floating pier off the coast of Gaza City. It's not a response, because they, Gaza needs 600 truckloads a day of supplies. And they can 10% can come through Egypt, because their crossing point is not uh, equipped to deal with large traffic but it can come from different crossings from Israel, and it does. I can report to you, and I'm happy, happy about it, prices in the markets in Gaza, in the food markets of Gaza, have dropped over the last few days over 50%. Because whatever the convoys brings becomes part of a black market, mainly by Hamas. Hamas normally, at least in Rafah region now, working behind UNRWA, which has been gutted by Hamas years ago. So get the humanitarian aid going. Uh, there is no, to the best of my knowledge, and I'm in touch with them, including uh, Mr. Sinwar, there is no famine in Gaza. And I don't think we are going there. Number two, there needs to be an understanding on what's going to be the governance of Gaza, bearing in mind that whoever takes responsibility in Gaza, and it's not going to be Israel, 
will have to cope with uh, the Hamas as an armed underground. They are not going away. So the Israelis, I assume, will keep the current level of military presence inside Gaza, outside the cities. So as to demonstrate to everybody we are here if, some, if, if it's needed, and when needed, go in and go out. Do the job and go out, like in Shifa now. It's one battalion of the 401 Brigade, which I was a proud member of in the 73 war, which goes in, deals with Shifa, and then will go out. So whatever government you will have in Gaza will, at least in the beginning, have the guarantee that the IDF is there. And the drones are in the sky and Air Force if needed in the sky. There are no bombings in Gaza anymore. Uh, who can take over Gaza? Nobody will come to police Gaza. Not the Arabs, not the Europeans, Americans, nobody. It has to be, it has to be some arrangement through which Palestinians can take it. Now, the people with the big money, Saudi Arabia and the UAE, are not willing to deal with the Palestinian Authority. They detest President Abbas. They refuse to deal with him. They urge him, just like the Americans do, to reform, or as it's called, revitalize the Palestinian Authority. That means cleanse it from corruption and fix the patronage system, etc. Uh, or they are not coming. And they have an interest in coming because they want the port in Gaza. Rebuild. Because the port in Gaza fits the general American-sponsored plan for the alternative trade corridor to the BRI, the IMEC, India Middle East Corridor, ending going through Saudi Arabia with railways, highways, pipelines, cables to Israel. And the Saudis and the UAE naturally would like to have uh, also Gaza as part of this. The, to Israeli ports. It can be a big boost to rebuilding of Gaza. To re As it was, you're not going to build back the refugee camps. You're going to build, once you get to it, you want to build a different uh, a Gaza. So here is the formula that I think will be, is the, the more, uh, the most uh, reasonable. An agency, run by Palestinians, not the apparatchiks of the PA, linked to the PA, but not subordinate to the PA, supervised by the World Bank, audited by, you choose, PwC, Deloitte, whoever, uh, in charge of the reconstruction and rebuilding uh, of Gaza. I know Israel will cooperate. If I have one minute, I'll say something about Israel. Uh, in Israel, it's very messy. We have a prime minister who and quarrel with the uh, chief of the military and the, uh, establishment and defense forces. We have, a pri we have a war cabinet with a lot of infighting between Bibi and his new partners who joined for the war. Uh, we have a buildup of resentment against him and his coalition government that started before the war with his judicial 
reform, which he still clings to, uh, and has now been uh, 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 reinforced. So you have two uh, reservoirs of political energy which are going to come to play whenever people in Israel feel that the war is basically over and hopefully hostages or at least some are back, that will come into play. One is the, the hundreds of thousands who protested against the judicial reform, they're still there. Some of them are demonstrating now, but people don't feel comfortable to demonstrate when you have every second day a soldier killed in Gaza. Uh, the second reservoir is the uh, civil society organizations, volunteers, hundreds of thousands, who replaced a dysfunctional government taking care of the population, especially those evacuated in the north and south, when the government ministries were absolutely not present. Like organizations like uh, Brothers in Arms, etc. They did a wonderful job. And the third is almost 300,000 reservists who were mostly re released by now. I have quite a few of them in my family. I'm not taking them in anymore. I'm not being called anymore to reserve. And they are angry. They are angry. And if you remember in 73, after the 73 war, October war of 73, it took few, few dozens of thousands of uh, demonstrators to get the great Golda Meir to resign. I thought it was unjustified then. I certainly think so, especially after I've seen Helen Mirren uh, <laughs> act. Uh, but we have a prime minister who was encouraged to resign by street peaceful demonstrations. And now it will be bigger. To conclude, I think Bibi understands he sees the polls, but his departure, I'm afraid, is going to be an ugly departure. Thank you. Well, many thanks to uh, Yari for a very comprehensive and enlightening uh, analysis. We've got about 15 minutes, so everyone's got to be very short with their comments or questions. and. Um, We'll get through as many as we can. So you can hop back up here and talk to the back of the room again. Just hang on. Um, Sinwa, I think he went to prison in Israel for murdering Palestinians. Is that right? Okay. And he served 22 years. Yes. Can the war end without Sinwa's capture? It's difficult because Sinwa is surrounding himself uh, with hostages. Now, nominally, we have 133 hostages now, supposedly in, uh, in the hands of Hamas. If there are 70, I would be happy. But Sinwar makes sure he's surrounding these hostages to deter the Israelis from uh, uh, taking action, from bombing wherever he is, even if they know. And I think they know have a fairly good idea where he is. Uh, one more point. We have to understand, Sinwar by now is alienated from the rest of the Hamas leadership, including inside Gaza. And they are telling him, what did you do? Where do you think you were going? So can we reach an end point uh, we seen were still alive somewhere I think so probably I will be quick thank you um, what do you think China and Russia are thinking particularly after the uh, Moscow attack of the weekend uh, the Moscow attack is a different opera it's ISIS Khorasan Afghanistan has to do with a long uh, 
settling a long uh, account that they have with, with, with the Russians over many other issues. Uh, the Chinese have decided to take a staunchly, for the first time, a staunchly anti-Israeli stance. Um, the Russians, the same. But when it comes to the practicalities, the, Chinas are, the Chinese are not in the Middle East. India is much more present militarily, Navy-wise, in, in the Middle East. Um, the Russians are there. And I'll give you just an example. To this moment, a Russian uh, Air Force officer sits in the Russian base in Khmeimim, near Latakia, Turkey, on a hotline with an Israeli Russian-speaking officer at our Air Force uh, command. And the Israeli will tell him 10 minutes before there is some raid on Iranian convoys in Syria, we are taking to, 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 to air. And what will the Russians do? Turn off the radars and make sure all their planes are, have landed. So the Russians have a lot to say, but in, in, in practical terms, they do not hinder the operation. Would you enlarge on what the current dispute is that you mentioned between the Israeli military and the Israeli political scene? It's not the political scene, it's Bibi. What, what is the dispute? The dispute is Bibi is trying to shift the blame uh, for the failure of October 7th exclusively uh, to the army. His uh, uh, entourage, including a son who is safely in Florida, keep hinting, keep, keep hinting that the performance of the army was lacking. Uh, in cabinet meetings, Bibi allows, in cabinet meetings, never before in Israel, Bibi allows um, ministers that he has appointed, some of them real hooligans. He allows them to insult the chief of staff, to attack him, to criticize him and then leak it to the media, which is always happy to get a good leak. They are hardly on speaking terms. You know, people sitting in the war cabinet, some of them happen to be good friends of mine for years, they are saying, you, you have two BBs now. One BB is the BB of the past. Serious, considerate, thoughtful. The other BB is the guy who calculates all the time his political, personal uh, considerations. And when they go into a meeting, they don't know which BB they will meet this time. Two quick questions. <laughs> One quick question. The Americans said yesterday that they have a unique plan to solve the RAFA issue without Israel going in there. Is there any intelligence on what that would be? Is it a, just a piper where they will all follow, follow up? I think it's, uh, it, 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 it indicates uh, uh, in the direction that I have suggested that you can deal with Rafah without storming Rafah. Uh, this is under discussion. You constantly have American top level uh, military presence in Israel, talking on a daily, hourly basis with the Israelis who are running the war. Uh, I think there is a fair amount of understanding uh, by the Americans that you have to finish the job. You cannot tolerate Hamas anymore. You're not going to make experiments. That means Rafah has to be dealt with. But it's not necessarily through, you know, sending a division into this crowded area. I think it's pretty uh, much uh, in agreement 
And this is why I don't see this, the, the, the Security Council resolution and the fact that the Americans abstained from a veto as a, as a big uh, catastrophe because the Americans knew we are not going, certainly not in Ramadan, into Rafah. So, okay, we have a resolution. Egypt and Jordan have long-standing peace treaties with Israel from 1979-1994. They both survived. They've got, both got contiguous borders. They are both large population countries with Sunni Muslim population. Can you explain to us why Egypt and Jordan don't try and take responsibility for their neighbouring Palestinian populations. Jordan is a very weak country, unfortunately, very fragile, now being threatened, threatened by the massing of Iranian Shiite militias along its borders with Iraq and, and Syria. And I was speaking about the, the, the drug trafficking and the we weapons uh, smuggling. It's serious. So Jordan is tied elsewhere. And uh, since the population of Jordan is 65% Palestinian, roughly so, the king is very reluctant to deal with his own street. Egypt, on the verge of bankruptcy, saved now by UAE, paying $25 billion for a piece of the coastline uh, along the Mediterranean, west of Alexandria, $25 billion. Uh, the last thing Egypt wants to see is what they saw a few years ago, thousands of Palestinians moving into Egypt. So they have bulldozed on their side, all three kilometers wide strip along the border with Gaza. And they are saying, deploy tanks. And they are saying, if Palestinians are trying to break through, they will be shot at. That's the Egyptian position. If I say to you, uh, ultimately, Every single, the blood of every single Palestinian civilian, either dead or injured, is ultimately on the hands of the Iranian Ayatollahs. And actually, in the big picture, nothing is going to change in the long term without dealing with the Iranian Ayatollahs. Comments, please. I agree with you, uh, but Everything has, there is a time for everything. I don't think now is the time, because I don't think the Iranians, in spite of all their enrichment, 60%, and sometimes by mistake beyond to 82%, I don't think the Iranians are in a hurry to assemble a bomb, although they can. And we know they know how to do it. So, sometime, we need to uh, all of us in the Middle East and the Western Allies, uh, all of us, we need to deal a blow, severe blow to their proxies. First, that's a must because this is the vanguard. The Iranians are willing to fight to the last Arab, whether he's a Shiite, a Sunni, or a Zaidi, like in Yemen. Not yet. And I don't think that it's in Israel's best interest to take an Iran on its own. Because whatever damage we can cause them will be this or that way short-lived. So yes, Iran is the head of the snake, as we say in Hebrew, but everything has its own time. Um, okay. Um, my question is regarding PR from Israel in the world. 
many of your points, um, like the amount of innocent deaths versus um, military deaths, does not come across in the world. And so Israel gets to be like the pariah. Yeah. Why is that so? Why isn't Israel doing better in that department? Because from okay. Hamas's point of view, they're winning that war. Because we have a totally dysfunctional government, a foreign ministry that has been uh, uh, allowed to sink to the bottom. Uh, we had, for example, a good spokesman in English uh, who got sacked yesterday, I think, who got sacked because uh, the wife of Mr. Netanyahu doesn't like the fact that at one point he participated in the demonstrations. So they take a guy who was doing very well in English, especially in UK, and they sack him. You, we have a government which is not, not functioning anymore. Many, most of the ministries do not. The foreign ministry was allowed to, to degrade, to be degraded. So uh, you can look around. They, they, don't, they don't concentrate on this. My wife, the Aussie, she says, the problem is Israelis are more interested in having debates amongst themselves than talking to the outside. And it's true. Can we just All right. Um, just one sort of question. UNRWA, where does it go from here? When does it go? Whatever. UNRWA has been uh, taken over by Hamas long ago. In 2009, they captured the union of UNRWA workers. What is UNRWA? It's 30,000 Palestinians working in UNRWA, many of them affiliated this way, that way with Hamas, certainly obeying Hamas orders. And a um, few dozens of uh, Westerners, mainly, uh, who don't speak Arabic, who live in sort of secluded, they call it pensions in Gaza, no more, but they used to. Uh, so there is no control. The head of UNRWA, Mr. Lazzarini, so often on television, I'm sure he's a favorite of ABC, uh, <laughs> Mr. Lazzarini is not in the region at all. If you want to reach him, please, Geneva. They are detached. And uh, uh, what the IDF found was that many of the uh, facilities of UNRWA served as Hamas bases because they thought, Hamas, that uh, if they are inside or under a UNRWA, uh, UNRWA facility, the Israelis will be hesitant. And they were for years, but not now. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I just want to say to Ehud Yari, thanks for a wonderful performance tonight. And uh, we've learned a lot, and I've learned a lot, I'm sure you all have. Everyone's busy, and you've got another appointment, so congratulations and good luck. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay.